right. So we are making our way through God's economics. We are looking at biblical pictures of provision, and we have worked our way up to the wilderness. We are still looking at the wilderness and things that are so valuable in lessons that God wants to teach his people through a wilderness experience. So wilderness, it can sometimes feel bad, but it's not all bad if we're getting everything out of it that the Lord wants to put into us. So we're going to pick up. We've just learned a little bit about manna. We're going to continue to learn things that the wilderness teaches us, that God was teaching his people, Israel, and we can extract those lessons from their experience for our own edification and our own understanding of the ways of God. So we are going to learn uh, about sharing, learning to share. Now, this might seem nonsensical. Again, again, we've talked about how it takes faith to trust God to eat today's manna rather than hoarding it all and, you know, putting it all aside so that it will be there tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or 20 years from now. No, manna is about learning to eat God's provision today. Today, not being afraid that God's not going to show up tomorrow and not provide food. It's an act of faith. It's an act of trust to eat the manna today. Well, sharing, learning to share. It's also when you're in this kind of survival mentality, learning to survive by the provision of God, not learning to survive in the worldly way of like, ah, I'm just scraping by. Things are hard. I'm just making a, you know, scraping by. No, we're not talking about that. When you're learning to survive completely and totally by the provision of God, which, as you know, the Lord has asked me to live that way completely by obedience to his voice, not asking anyone for anything, just trusting God and obeying his voice. And I am living proof he has never failed me. He has done amazing and spectacular things in my life, including he has sent me literally all over the world by faith, and he has never failed me on no matter what continent I've been on, no matter what nation I've been in, God has absolutely proven himself faithful. But part of the wilderness is learning to share. So at the very time that you might want to keep everything all to yourself, God is training us to share. So let's look at what that meant for the Israelites. We're in Exodus 16, starting with verse 16. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. We, I think we might have read this before but we're reading uh, through some verses that we did not read through before. You shall each take an omer. We talked about how that's about two quarts, um, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. So if you have, you know, 10 people in your family, then you're taking 10 omers, okay? But that's that's plenty for each person to eat each day. Here we go. This is verse 17. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. Okay, so you picture this. The whole community is going out and everybody's just gathering, 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 get it, get it all together. And then they measure it back out by the omer so that every person in each household gets a full omer of their daily provision from God of their guess what? Daily bread. Their daily bread. This is their daily bread that God is providing for them. And so people gathered whatever they could. They bring it together. Some people gathered more. They were, you know, like up and at them. They had their cup of coffee. Let's go gather up some manna. And some were a little sleepy. They gathered a little bit less. But when they measured it all out by the Omer, everyone had as much as they needed. And you got to love God. There was nothing left over. God doesn't waste a thing. There was no lack and there were no leftovers. So there's no temptation to leave anything for tomorrow, which is just going to stink and fester. 
God provided exactly to the piece of manna, exactly as much as was needed for his people every single day. That is just mind-blowingly amazing. But what's even better is when we start to give the contrast. Now, remember, everyone else in the whole entire world the whole world, every other nation, every other tribe, every other tongue, the way that they are living is the way of the sword. The way that they are living is by violence. The way that they are living is by oppression and domination. If I want your stuff, I'm going to take your stuff. If I want your stuff enough, I'm just going to take you. I'm just going to take use violence against you, make you my slave, put you in subjection to me, take all of your stuff for myself rule over you. You see, so violence and not sharing, but forced, dominated control of the resources was the way that the rest of the world was living. But among the people of God, hey, let's go gather up some manna and share it one for all equally. Isn't that beautiful that God's people were learning how to share so that everyone had everything that they needed and no one had any lack? Sharing is the way that it should be among God's people. Open-handed, open-handed generosity, because we all need to believe that God will be faithful, especially you have to get this deep, deep down into you. And we we are going to talk about giving. But when you give, when you give to the poor, when you give to someone who is in need, when you give to someone who has less than you do, that makes God so happy. God is not going to ever, ever let you go without when you have been open-handed and generous towards your brothers and sisters, especially those in the household of faith. And of course, also the poor, whether they are believers yet or not. But among God's people, there should be sharing. And you know what happened? Here's the example of this. Once the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, well, guess what? A couple chapters later, in Acts chapter 4, there was a supernatural abundance. There was a supernatural because people were now functioning by the heart of God, by the will of God, by the direction of God. The Spirit of God was dwelling inside of them. And the Spirit of God, the same Spirit, if we are believers, if we are truly, truly believers, the Spirit of God dwells inside of us. Well, when a whole community of believers who were full of the Holy Spirit, when they got together, among them there was no lack. That's in the book of Acts chapter 4. The early believers, it said they had all things in common and no one considered anything to be his own. They even sold their houses. They gave it all to the community of believers so that there would be no lack among them. That was God's design. But part of the way that there's no lack among the people of God is that wilderness training is about learning to share. All right, so we are continuing through the wilderness, and we're going to take a look at how God trained and disciplined Israel to understand his ways, his heart, his ways, his ability to provide, and how Israel needs to learn how to revere him and obey him because he is God and he is worthy of that. So the first thing we're going to look at, we're moving through the the journey of Israel through the wilderness. And the first thing they come up against, this is within the first 50 days of uh, being out of slavery in Egypt. So it's in the first year of the wilderness, and it's even before the law of God has been given. It's been before the Ten Commandments are given. But the people, yet again, another time, they come up to a place where there is no water, and they're thirsty, and their livestock is thirsty, and they start to grumble 
grumble against the Lord. They start to grumble because they do not believe that God is able to provide for them. So they complain. And here's, let's go to Exodus 17, starting with verse 3. But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Okay, so this is the recurring theme of the grumbling. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. So this is the same staff. Remember, the Israelites at this point, God bless them, and he does bless them. But at this point, they have seen plague after plague after plague after plague. Ten massive plagues poured out on Egypt. They have seen Moses lift up a stick a stick, lift up a stick and part the waters of the Red Sea. Now, Moses didn't do it. God did it. But they saw that God was with Moses and God was doing these amazing things to provide for them. They had already seen what we talked about before, that at another point in time, they came up to putrid water. And God said to Moses, take a different stick. Don't throw the staff of God in the water, in the putrid water. Take a different stick over there. Throw that in the water and I'll make the water clean. They had seen that. They had drunk that water. With, I mean, it was only a couple of weeks, only a couple of weeks before they're grumbling again and not believing that God is able to provide. And this is after God had led them to the oasis called Elim, where there was a natural oasis and natural spring. Springs, 12 springs. It's like one spring for each tribe. Come on, how much more could you ask for? But so God says, take that staff, the same staff with which you already worked miracles for me, with me, and go. And so we're picking up at verse six. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because quarreling of the people, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So even after Israel had seen all of these amazing signs and wonders and miracles, they still, their hearts were still hard. They couldn't believe. They were still Every day, even as they were eating miracle bread, they're like, I don't know, is God among us or not? You know, like, I know we ate this miracle bread this morning, but this just doesn't look right to me. We're in this desert wasteland. This can't possibly be the call of God. This can't possibly be all there is. This is not the promised land. I'm not happy about this. Okay, they just, do, they, they didn't understand the ways of God yet. They didn't understand what God was doing. And they didn't understand. This is the most important thing. They hadn't grasped the goodness of God. They didn't have any clue about the goodness of his nature and his character and his love. They, they couldn't get their minds and their hearts wrapped around the fact that God redeemed them because he loved them. He loved their ancestors and chose to set his affection on them. And so there was no way he was going to let them perish of hunger and starvation in the wilderness because that's not what a loving father does. And yes, God calling himself a father is not just in the New Testament. God calls himself a father to Israel multiple times throughout the Old Testament. You can find that on your own time. But God, like a loving father, was always going to provide for his people in the wilderness. But they just didn't get that yet. They couldn't help themselves from complaining. 
And they tested the Lord. They didn't believe him by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And you can see Psalm 78 is a wonderful psalm. It gives a full recap of the faithfulness of God, even in the midst of Israel's unfaithfulness and grumbling and unbelief and hardened hearts and testing God again and again and again, and how God faithfully continued to be with them, continued to bless them, continued to pour himself out to them. And Psalm 78 ends with, and and chose David to be their king. So that goes a little farther than where we're at today. But Psalm 78, if you want to read that in your own time, it will give you an idea, a better understanding of what it means to test God and put God to the test. Well, wilderness training for us, we don't want to be putting God to the test. Don't put God to the test through unbelief. We only want to test God in the good things, meaning we're testing and proving the perfect and pleasing will of God, according to Romans 12, 2, that we have so surrendered our lives to him that we're proving his existence and giving him marvelous glory because we're putting him to the test of things that he loves to prove that he is God and he is able. But wilderness testing, testing the Lord by saying, I I don't know, is God with me or not? And testing the Lord through unbelief, we don't want to do that. Wilderness training is about faith. Wilderness training is about believing God, standing in faith and believing God, no matter how impossible the situation might look. And so, Israel, they go through, if you know the story, they go through 40 years in the wilderness. Well, there's another instance of water from the rock. It's in the 40th year. So the one we just went through, that's in the first year of the wilderness. It's within the first 50 days. But the second one, the one we're about to talk about, this I think is in the first month of the 40th year. But if it's not in the first month of the 40th year, it's still in the 40th year. So what's happened is a whole generation of grumblers has now passed away. They have died in the wilderness because they tested God by not having faith that God was able to bring them into the promised land when he had said he was going to about 38, 39 years earlier. So God said, all right, that's it. There's going to be one year for every day that the spies were in the land. You're going to be here for 40 years. And all of you who were old enough to have seen all the miracles that I did and didn't believe me anyway, didn't believe I was able, even after seeing all that, you didn't believe that I was able to bring you into the promised land. If that's you, then you're going to die in the wilderness and you're not going to enter into the wilderness. Well, this now we're in the 40th year. And so it's not those people. They have already perished in the wilderness. But there's a new generation and God wants to demonstrate his faithfulness and his power to the new generation because they were so young or they weren't even born yet when God did all the miracles in Egypt and the walking through the Red Sea and all of that wonderful stuff. So God wants to reveal himself and his power and his ability to provide to this new generation. Unfortunately, what this new generation is, it's a new generation of grumblers. Ah. So a new generation of grumblers is now in the wilderness and they come to a place where there is no water. And they must have gotten this from their parents because their grumbling is almost verbatim exactly the same as the grumbling of their parents. You know, why did you bring us out to this place? You just brought us here to kill us. It would have been better for us if we stayed in Egypt. Almost the same exact grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay. So even though God had faithfully provided for them for 40 years every day, and some of them, that's the only life they'd ever known that God just miraculously sends food every day, they're still grumbling. So, But this time, God gives Moses a different instruction. This time, we're starting with Numbers chapter 20, starting with verse 8. He says, "'Take the staff and assemble the congregation.'" 
you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock, some translations will say, speak to the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So Moses is not instructed by God to strike the rock the way that he was 40 years ago. Now he's told to speak to the rock. He's supposed to walk up to the rock and say, rock, yield your water. And so I was about to say in Jesus' name, because I'm so used to, you know, commanding in the name of Jesus, because my name doesn't do any good, but Jesus' name is good. But Moses didn't know Jesus' name yet. He was just told by God to go speak to the rock, speak to the rock, tell the rock, rock, yield your water. Ah, okay, so we're picking up, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. So we're up to verse 10. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. So, okay, wait a second. Did you see it? God told Moses, speak to the rock. What did Moses do? He struck the rock. That's not what God said. God said that 40 years ago, but that's not what God said this time. God also did not say, Moses, you're a pretty powerful guy. Why don't you go bring water out of that rock? No, Moses has no power. I'm actually glad for my little blunder because it was able, it made me able to say, my name has no power. If I'm not commanding something in Jesus' name, I'll get nothing, okay? God didn't say, Moses, you go bring water out of the rock, but that's the way Moses presented it to the people. Shall we bring water out of the rock for you? As if Moses, by striking a rock with a stick, has the ability to bring supernaturally abundant water out of a rock for about two million people. Come on. You can't just walk up to a rock and hit it and, and, you know, give two million people and all their livestock something to drink. So Moses, this is what it means. He did not honor God as holy. It's not about that he was violent toward the rock. You know, God was standing on the rock in the last uh, instance, in the the first year. But this time, Moses was just supposed to speak to the rock. But it's not that he struck it. It's not just this simple act of disobedience, which he did do, but it's that he didn't honor God. So let me give you a contrast. Here's a contrast example of what Moses could have done instead. Now, I understand that Moses is frustrated, he's angry, he's disappointed in the people. And you know what? After 40 years of leading a bunch of grumblers, you would be frustrated too, all right? There are days... Oh, man, I have a lot of sympathy for Moses because people can get frustrating and they don't listen and they grumble and then they create their own problems and then they grumble at you and then uh, it just gets really annoying. So I understand. I feel Moses' pain. Actually, I probably don't have a clue of how much pain Moses was actually in. He was frustrated. I get it. However, he had a choice. Instead of him saying, shall we bring water out of the rock? He could have said, People of Israel, he could have reasoned with them. People of Israel, has God not provided for you faithfully for the last 40 years? Has God not proven himself faithful in everything that we have been through from our days in Egypt? Has God not proven faithful to keep his promise to our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Has you know, he could have exalted the Lord. The Lord your God is the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord your God can bring water out of a pebble. The Lord your God. He could have exalted God. He could have honored the Lord as holy. But that's not what he did. He said, here now, you rebels. That part, God understands. Moses understands. I gotcha. I feel you. But shall we bring water out of the rock for you? Nah, uh, uh, uh. You don't have that. You can't do that. That's way out of line. And you're not honoring God as holy in the sight of the people. 
And so God being so awesome and awesomely good, even though Moses didn't hit it, well, that's a pun, no pun intended. He did hit the rock, but he didn't hit it. He didn't hit the target on obedience, but God still faithfully poured water out. So some of you have looked at this passage and you've said like, well, but the water came out, so you got what you wanted. So like, what's the problem? Like, okay, what? Because Moses eventually is forbidden from entering the promised land and Aaron as well, because they did not honor God as holy in the sight of the people. It's a really big deal. So Moses is punished, you might say. He's forbidden from entering the promised land because of this instance right here. But it's because of the goodness of God. It's not just about you pray, you get what you want, so it must be God's will. No, you can you got to have a deeper discernment than that. No. God because he's so good and he knew his people and their lives Stock, and God cares about the livestock because he created them too. He knew they were thirsty and that they needed water. So in spite of Moses' disobedience, he brought forth water and gave water to his people. But what we can extract from this wilderness training is about learning obedience and to persevere in honoring God. Honor God honor God so that everyone can see his mighty hand, not your mighty hand. It's not about you being powerful. It's about that God is powerful and that you understand to the depth of your being that God is good, that God is love, that God loves you, that God is able to provide for you. He is willing to provide for you. And that by faith, by not testing him through unbelief, but by faith, and persevering and honoring him, he will never fail us. All right, so we're going to keep going. We'll go through this example quickly. But there are also two different instances of the people receiving quail from the Lord. I'm sure they grumbled for meat more than just two times, but there are two times when the Lord answered them specifically by sending quail, meat for them to eat. So, But we want to look again at the contrast between these two different instances because it gives us insight into how God trains his people through the wilderness and in the wilderness. So the first time that there's quail from the Lord, this is before strike the rock. This is before the grumbling, and this is before the manna. So in chronological order, it's a little before what we just talked about with the strike the rock and water comes out in the first 50 days. But just follow along. I believe the Lord wanted it to be in this order to express the seriousness of learning God's ways in the wilderness. So this is the first year. It's in the first month. It's in the first few weeks after they have come out of Egypt. And you remember, they grumbled, grumble, grumble. I think we read the passage before about their grumbling and how they were complaining because they're like, hey, in Egypt, we had pots of meat. And they completely forgot that they had been slaves. Well, God responds. And so we're going to read from Exodus 16, starting with verse 12. I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel. This is the Lord speaking. Say to them, at twilight, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay on the ground around the camp. And so that dew, once that dew cleared, then the manna was there for the first time, just to give you the sequencing of where we are, because I know we were a little ahead and we went backwards a little, but this is the same instance where God gave quail and the first instance of manna at the same time. So the people were hungry for meat and God, you know, he's the creator of all of creation, the whole universe. Everything is sovereign under his control. So he demonstrated his absolute sovereign ability to provide miracle meat in the middle of nowhere. 
He's just like, you know, all the birds, they, the birds already know that God is God. If you're listening to this and you have, you're out on your deck and you're hearing a bird chirping, that bird is singing the glory of God. All of creation declares the glory of God. So all God has to do is say, hey, quails, go over to this patch of the Sinai Peninsula and, you know, just fly around there and actually fly at around a height of three feet because my people are going to catch you and eat you. The quail, they're all like, praise the Lord, let's go. You know, like they don't give any argument to God. They're they're created beings. They worship God. They know that God is God. They're not confused about that. It's only humans that get confused about that because we want to be God rather than give God glory. But I'm digressing a little. Help me stay focused. Okay, so what this is, is that often in the early days, of the wilderness. And we can experience this as well if we are in a season of wilderness, which I call wilderness training. So in the early days of the wilderness, God will sometimes and often does reveal himself in mighty ways, mighty, miraculous, amazing ways to demonstrate his sovereign ability to do the impossible. Now, my salvation experience, I will never forget it. You know, I call it a Red Sea experience. And I see this in my own life, my own history with the Lord. I see this in other people's lives and their journey with the Lord. In the first initial salvation experience and the months or even year or so that follows, God is like, boom, 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 boom. He's just blessing their socks off and showing himself to be God in their life. Like, you know, I don't know, walking through the Red Sea, that would be memorable. You would never forget walking through the waters of the sea on dry ground. And not just you, but two million people with you. It's your, So God gives us what I call Red Sea experiences. Well, this instance with the quail, I know it's not the same as walking through the Red Sea, but I would call that in the category of like the Red Sea experiences. It's in those initial times when God is confirming himself to his people. So he's demonstrated here that he's able to do the impossible and provide miracle meat for two million people out of nowhere. But here we go. In the second year of the wilderness, the same people, they start grumbling again because not only are they grumbling for meat like they had in Egypt, but they're tired of manna. And so this time they test God, not just through unbelief, but they test God by making a demand. They're like, well, God, if you're really God, give us what we want. Give us what we crave. What you're providing for us is not good enough. So they made a demand. Well, if you haven't noticed, making a demand is not exactly reverent. It's not exactly humble. It is not the way to humble yourself before an almighty God. They made demands according to their craving, and they made demands to suit their own carnality, okay? They could have lived just fine on the continued manna that God was providing, but that wasn't good enough for them. They were grumbling, they were complaining, and they were making demands because their flesh was getting out of control. So, Here we go. God gave them over to their own evil desire. That does not mean that God approved of their desire. Just because God fulfilled their demand is not an endorsement of their demand. And so sometimes you got to get some wisdom. You got to get some discernment. Sometimes you're looking at situations in people's lives and you're like, they just got what they asked for. Don't think that it's because they're so if there are other things going on, it's not always an endorsement of what they're doing just because God answers the request. And we touched on that with that God gave water, even though Moses had completely messed up the command and not honored the Lord as holy. So this time God gives them over. He sends quail. But at the same time, a plague breaks out. So we'll read this passage quickly. Quickly. 
Numbers 11, starting with verse 18, and say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow you shall eat meat. And for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? It was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall not just eat one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? But Moses said, the people among whom I number 600,000 on foot. So that's just the men, not including women and children. So God, you're going to send meat for a month for two million people, and you have said, I will give them meat that they may not eat a whole, that they may eat a whole month? Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them and be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them and be enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's hand shortened? I mean, the Lord is like, seriously, you think that's hard? Moses, obviously, at this point, didn't know yet that the Lord was going to send quail again. So meat, he didn't know how the Lord was going to send meat. Maybe he thought because meat had been a a year ago that God wasn't going to do the quail a second time. But God is like, it's not hard for me. I'm God. Is my hand so short that I can't give you quail for a month, no matter how many people you are? He's saying, now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. Wow. God is like, come on, don't you be doubting me in the wilderness just because it looks impossible. Am I God or am I not? Okay. If I'm God, then my arm is not short. All right. So let's get some faith and believe God. That's what wilderness training is about. It is also about learning to not make selfish, flesh-indulging, carnal demands on God's ability and generosity. He is not our servant. He is not our slave. And he is not a slave to our cravings. I see this also in people in Western cultures. You want God to maintain some luxurious lifestyle for you when God has called you into a different season. Or even when you're in that season, you start asking God, oh, but can't I have this? And can't I have that? Because I had that when I was living my lifestyle before. And I can speak from experience on this because I I was a guilty offender too. I've done it. I understand it. It doesn't make it right. God is not a slave to our cravings or our demand for luxury or comfort. Wilderness training is also about growing in simplicity. Simplicity. Keep it simple. Become simple. Simple. You don't need all that stuff, okay? You just need bread, water, Jesus. You're good. Gratitude, contentment with what God has provided rather than grumbling, unbelief, discontentment. It's not good. We've got to push past that into the Spirit of the Lord. And also, learning to submit ourselves to God, to his timing, to his provision, and for his purposes, not longing for the pleasures of this world or the demands of our flesh. 